Excellent. Mm -hmm. So now is the time to move those bones, scratch those itches, cough those coughs. In a minute or two's time, we'll begin this evening's talk. <coughs> <laughs> so, okay, here we go. So I try and uh, give a talk which is relevant sometimes to some which has happened to me recently. And yesterday I was doing an interview for a guy doing a thesis in psychology at one of our local universities. And uh, he was talking about something which keeps coming up again and again and again. People who have got low self-esteem. And how does that really tie in with the idea in Buddhism of no self at all? So the title of this talk today is No Self-Esteem. <laughs> We're working it out in a brilliant, beautiful way. But in brief, I was saying that you just can't move from people who've got low self-esteem, who feel they're hopeless, they're useless, they're a failure, they're not good enough, to move from that straight to this incredibly wonderful idea of non-self in Buddhism. You can't just make that jump. You have to go through the stepping stone of no self-esteem, you know, feeling good about yourself, and then from feeling good about yourself to feeling good about your no self. <laughs> and that's actually how it usually works. But it comes up again and again and again. I'm sure that many people here feel they're not good enough, they should be better. That happens over in Bodhinyana Monastery and probably in Nuns Monastery as well. People think they aren't good enough. They've got low self-esteem. And my goodness, if anyone should have low self-esteem, it's me. Look, I'm a total failure in life. I'm over 60 years of age and I've got no superannuation, no bank accounts, no assets, no visible means of support. That's what happens sometimes when you go to government agencies and they say, what means of support have you got? And I say, nothing. I'm totally poor. I'm under the, totally under the poverty uh, level. That's why I sometimes like going to government departments. You know, when you go to government departments and they ask you all these questions, and it's really easy to put no, 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 no. And that really confuses the hell out of them. They don't know what to do with you because you've got no marriage license, you've got no property, you don't own a car, you haven't got a driver's license, no marriage certificate. You don't exist. <laughs> You're totally off the scale being a monk or a nun in our modern world because everything which they measure you by, you don't qualify. That's why I love going to government departments and they get very upset with me. So anyway, but I've got, have I got self-esteem, no self-esteem or whatever it is? I certainly haven't got low self-esteem. You know, when we first came to Australia, that was 28 years ago, as monks, you never get so many people come to a talk like this. You'd be lucky if you get five come to a talk. That's at the beginning and probably half of those would leave or maybe more you know, before the talk was finished and the other two were fast asleep. <laughs> so in those days, it was very tough. And in those days, people weren't used to men walking around in dresses, which was what I looked like. They weren't used to you. And so many times people would criticize you and they'd shout at you. And they would even once they threw stones at me. And that was over in Bunbury Beach many years ago. These kids, I was just meditating there, minding my own business. And this stone came whizzing past my ears. Very good, they were bad shots. But as I got closer and closer, I thought, I'd better do something. So I just stood up and turned around. And these were these kids. For those of you old enough, that was when the orange people were here. They thought I was an orange person. Fair enough mistake, this is pretty orange. But I, said, I actually started walking to them. And it's amazing when you face people 
who do things like that, as soon as I started walking towards them, they started running away. <laughs> There's about six or seven kids there, and they could have very easily beaten me up, but just the confidence there was enough to get them to scatter. And I just rushed after them and caught them up and said, look, where are you throwing stones from? I'm a Buddhist monk. Oh, you're a Buddhist monk, sorry. We thought you were an orange person. Buddhist monks are cool. <laughs> So we had a nice conversation about Buddhism afterwards. But sometimes, you know, you do get criticized like that. You do get put down. But as a monk, you don't lose your self-esteem. Somebody called me up from, where was it today? Or I visited or something, I can't remember. And they just said their son was being bullied at school. And bullying is a big thing. And they said the little teaching which really helped them, a very simple teaching, was that teaching which I took back from Thailand, which means you don't listen to other people's criticisms. It was that teaching, if somebody calls you a dog, you look at your bottom to see if you've got a tail. If you haven't got a tail, you're not a dog, it is the end of the problem. And this actually happened because these bullies, they called this kid a dog, and he was, remembered the story. This was a kid at school, he remembered the story. He looked at his bottom, sorry, I haven't got a tail, I'm not a dog. And those kids stop bullying him after that because you know, he has some sense of confidence there. They were just trying to press his buttons to make him upset. He decided not to allow his buttons to be pressed. And you have the choice for that. But why is it that people do have this sense of low self-esteem, which becomes a very, very big problem for many people? There's so many people who think they're not clever enough, girls who think they're not beautiful enough, even though they are really gorgeous. You have guys who think they're not attractive enough, even though they're really good people. Why is it monks who think they're not, they're not good enough as a teacher, they're not good enough as, as a novice or as a nun? Why do people think that way? The reason is because in our society we have this terrible thing about attaining for the highest, have really high goals and expectations in life. We see that on the advertisements. You haven't lived until you've actually driven a, you know, a heart. Actually, I saw one of these new Triumphs on the road the other day. 2.3 litre you know, motorbikes. Wow, you haven't lived until you've gone on a 2.3, the biggest engine on a motorbike ever built. Wow, you haven't lived. I was thinking about that, getting on one of those, finding someone who's got one, and see if they wanted to make some good karma. But you know, it's not very... <laughs> it's not good, a monk going on a motorbike. And the reason is, these robes, that's the trouble. As soon as you get any wind in them, they blow up, and off you go like a balloon, like a parachute. But anyway, you know, the idea was there. <laughs> but you know, why is it that people just you know, think that they have to have all these things to be worthwhile in this world? And that is one of the problems. Our expectations are just too high for ourselves, let alone for others. So my buzzword for the last month to my monks, to the people I teach internationally, is please, lower your expectations. And a beautiful thing, I don't have to be so pretty. I don't have to be so strong. I don't have to be so successful. Oh, bliss at last, I can just be me. Now that is a powerful teaching. Because where do we get all these expectations from? And you know, it's, a lot of times it's not from the people who really love us and care for us. They just want us to be happy, that's all. Yeah, if you're happy being a billionaire, fine. But you know, if you're not, we can still love you. Yeah, we're happy if you know, you're sort of very successful in your career, but we love you nevertheless if you're not. If you're a total failure, your loved ones love you nevertheless. So you can lower your expectations and not try so hard to meet these goals which other people give you. Because sometimes when we have all these expectations, now you tell your kids that. Because sometimes the sort of expectations you give your kids, if you're not top of the class, or at least in the top 5%, you're not good enough. 
Only one twenty no, one twentieth of kids can come up in the top five percent. So you've got to have some kids in the bottom half. You know, they're the very happy, they're the smart kids. I keep on saying this, that you have to, as soon as you fail your first examination at school, then you're out of there. You're free at last. You're out of prison. Because if you pass the exam, you have to go back to school the next year and do another exam. And then another and another and another. So when you fail your first exam, yeah, I'm free now. <laughs> Now I'm doing that because half the children in the school will be in the bottom 50%. So you've got a 50-50 chance, that's your children. Please love them to bits. They don't have to be good at school. Has anyone who's read that wonderful book by Daniel Coleman, who is a Buddhist, The Emotional Intelligence? People are successful not because they do well at school. Not because they come in the top 10, 15, 20, 50 percent. Because they're emotionally intelligent. They feel loved. They feel accepted. They have self-esteem because that comes from their parents. Never criticizing them, never putting them down. Never feeling they have to attain what is beyond their abilities. They feel that they are worthwhile. Those are the people who become successful in life. So for goodness sake, stop imbuing your children with what will later be their low self-esteem because they're in that bottom 50% who don't do so well. Even bottom 50%, even the bottom 70%, you feel a failure. You feel a failure if you're not the top, if you're not the most beautiful, if you're not the most successful in life. Come on. You can be real that you have to learn how to lower expectations to learn how to be yourself, and then you are successful, then you have the happiness in life. So instead of asking too much of people, and especially asking too much of yourself, we have this wonderful openness of character to love ourselves for who we are, that famous opening the door of your heart to yourself no matter who you ever be. Now, a lot of times you can't get that from others because others will always be criticizing you when you don't meet the goal. If you meet the goal, they set the goal higher for you. And they think that's really encouraging you to achieve more in life. The so-called pursuit of excellence is just the pursuit of stress and an early death through heart attack. And you don't really want to follow that course. Do you in this life? That's one of the reasons why it's such a stressful life. Is that really what excellence truly is? with all these achievements and all these honours and all these possessions which you have, is that really achievements in life? Is that excellence? Or is excellence being at peace with yourself, being able to go to sleep at night with no feeling that you've been failed, you failed today, at the end of the year not feeling that you're a hopeless case? Is that worth so-called pursuit of material excellence? Or is it much better to have this wonderful emotional intelligence where you can love yourself for who you are? Where you realize you don't have to be successful to feel at peace. You don't have to meet all these goals which other people put on you. That is why my job as a teacher is to take away all those goals. To tell people you don't have to be the most beautiful. You don't have to be the most rich. I've been telling this over in Singapore and Malaysia to all the youth groups which I teach. I tell the boys, please never marry a beautiful girl. Because if you marry a beautiful woman, other boys will be looking at her and you'll be jealous for the rest of your life. Marry an ugly one and you'll never be jealous because no other boy looks at her. And if you're a girl, never marry a rich boy. Because if he is rich, he'll be able to afford a mistress. <laughs> marry a poor boy, and he will never be able to afford another wife. You'll have him all for yourself. And <laughs> by saying things like that, it gives all of the ugly girls and the poor boys a big boost of esteem. <laughs> I don't have to be 
rich to get a girl. I don't have to be beautiful to get a boy. I can just be myself. And you know, on just adding to that, you know, when I do teach these youth groups, especially these young people who are going, uh, starting out looking for a partner in their life, a lot of times they say, look, you know, just being beautiful, being rich, that's not really important. What people really find attractive is being confident. Because when you're confident, you can have good fun, you can relax. You're a person who's not really stressed out trying to prove themselves to others. And many people find that incredibly attractive. Confidence, being at ease, being fun. And you don't get that by just being beautiful or being rich. You get that because of your emotional intelligence. Basically, you're accepting yourself as you are. Now in Buddhism, especially in meditation, we have this beautiful little phrase we say to ourselves, good enough. So in our life, we say, it's good enough. Our monasteries, they're good enough. This hall here is good enough. Yet yeah, it could be better. Sometimes we fantasized about how we could improve this hall for you so on a Friday night you could be more comfortable. You could have this electronically digital sort of uh, meditation cushion. You press a button to make it sort of come up, become more fluffy, or another button to make it harder. You could have it like electronically warmed. You could even have it with a press of button, you get a cappuccino on the side, or a latte, in case you have sloth and top and feel tired, you can have a quick cup of coffee. <laughs> so you, you can have all these ideas, but no. This is good enough. Because when it's good enough, it means you can just appreciate it. You don't have to go criticizing and thinking it has to be different. And this all is good enough. And now your job, yeah, you could get more money, but if you get more money, you'd have to work harder. That's a big problem. That's my problem in life, is too many people listen to my talks. So I want to try and get rid of more of you. Uh, because I'm too busy, I get all these invitations this evening. Somebody just came back from Sri Lanka, lucky, and you were telling me, oh, you have to go to Sri Lanka, people are missing you over there, you have to go, you have to go. Oh, I'm getting fed up with going in these aircraft all the time and travelling around. I I'm old, I want to rest, I want to retire. I'm not going to more. So I want to go to the opposite of Charm School. If anybody wants to donate to me going to um, Uncharm School, so I can be more mean and miserable <laughs> and have a more peaceful life. <laughs> but no, it's good enough. So it just, during the meditation, people are taking photographs of me. And I'm just like, now look, what are they taking photographs of me for? I'm old, fat and ugly. <laughs> but it's good enough. So please don't take too many photographs, because when I was in Indonesia, people were telling me that beautiful monument, Borod Pudor, you know, this incredible beautiful monument, it's built 600, 700 years ago. It's a, it's a national treasure, this old Buddhist uh, uh, monument. People are taking so many photographs of it, it's actually wearing out. So please, I'm wearing out too, because <laughs> too many photographs. And all these lights on. But no, no, being serious. You don't have to be anything to have self-esteem. You are good enough. You can make mistakes. You don't always have to perform to the highest. Look, I said in the early years when I first came here, my talks were terrible. People would actually walk out of the talks. I remember this, uh, this one lady, she's running our Buddhist fellowship over in uh, Singapore. Just to see, she went into the library and got the oldest talk she could find of mine from the library. She listened to it and she said, that was the worst talk I've ever heard in my life. And it was right, it was a bad talk because, you know, you just learn on the job. I remember once giving a talk to a group of Thai people. And they travelled all the way from Thailand to visit this place and to give some donations and they wanted a talk in Thai. So I gave them a talk in Thai and after the talk in Thai, because I was in Thailand for many years, I was fluent when I lived there, they all said, wow, that was so impressive. We've never heard a talk in Sanskrit before. <laughs> and I said, actually, that was in Thai. 
Oh, said the Thai people, we didn't know. We thought it was... <laughs> That's really a put down. But look, would you lose your self-esteem as a result? No, for me, I thought that's wonderful. There's another story I can, I can say, tell to people to make them laugh. So every time I make a mistake and do something stupid, I never think it is a reason to lose my self-esteem. Instead, I thought, I'm a human being. I make mistakes. It's good enough. What a wonderful thing it is to know that you can be wrong. So please, grab your right to be wrong. <laughs> you don't always have to do things in a perfect, wonderful way. Lower your expectations. You know, I always expect during the meditation, at least I used to a few years ago, that people would turn off their mobile phones. But I've lowered my expectations now. And as long as there's not more than five calls, I'm very, very happy <laughs> during the meditation. Otherwise, you get angry and upset and it will spoil your whole day. But no, instead we lower our expectations and then we can have much more fun and happiness. When the mistakes do happen in life, when you make a mistake, you never feel that it's some failure in yourself. That mistakes are part of life and we celebrate those mistakes rather than thinking that we are a failure. So you come here and you're hopeless and I would always tell you, very good. When people come up here and they say, they've just robbed a bank, and I say, very good, 10% to the nuns monastery. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't say that. <laughs> if you said you were just uh, meditating and fell fast asleep, I say, very good. In fact, I've learned the word very good in so many languages now. You know, it's Bahoma Hondai in, that's in Sinhala, in Bagusakali, that's over in um, uh, Bahasa, Indonesia, or Mantok Mantong, I think that's in Sulawesi dialect. Because that's a wonderful word to learn, very good. You know, I don't know, no, D Mark in Thai, I don't, or oh, D Lai, that's in Laotian, I don't know how to say very bad, except in English. I don't learn that word. I don't want to know it. Thank you very much. Because that way, whatever people do or say, I say, very good. And that way you're building up people's confidence so they feel at ease with themselves because at least I'm at ease with you. I respect you no matter who you are. And that's not just with you guys. I go into prisons and people tell me that they've done this terrible crime. I say, very good. And that really spins them out. What do you mean? <laughs> When I say you're a leader in your field, there's never been a bank robber like you before. It's amazing just <laughs> the skills which you have. <laughs> because a lot of people in prison, they do have this terrible lack of self-esteem, which is one of the reasons why they keep going back there, because they think they don't deserve to be free. Do you get the idea here? When you have a lack of self-esteem, you punish yourself. You can never be free. So as soon as I tell people who have done terrible things, very good, what I'm doing there is taking away the course while they'll repeat those bad things again. So if you go home this weekend and your husband says he's committed adultery, he's slept with your best friend, please tell him, very good. <laughs> That will spin him out. <laughs> what the hell are you up to? <laughs> but what it really means there, it's just, what's going on here? He just uh, <laughs> does a bit of, uh, blows a few fuses in his brain so he can say, well, it's an amazing girl. You know, she's not going to get angry at me. Well, I'm not going to go with that mistress. I'm going to stay with her. Because a lot of time when you're allowed to make mistakes, number one, you're honest about them, as I kept saying. When you're not allowed to make mistakes, we hide them, we're in denial, we don't admit them, so we can never do anything about them. You made a mistake, great. It's allowed. 
So don't use it as losing your self-esteem. So what happens? You feel good about yourself. You feel you're okay. You feel that you're not some person in this world who's, you know, somehow or other, you know, when you were made, that some parts were left out. And when you feel part of this world, when you feel that you belong in this world, that's what we call, you know, the self-esteem. You're good enough. You've lowered the expectations. You don't expect to be perfect. You who are who you are, and you belong, and you are welcome. That's why, you know, we don't really have a dress code when we come into this place. Sometimes people try to impose one, but you come dressed whatever you like. Except me, I've got a dress code. I have to wear these robes because I'm a monk. We don't really just have bouncers at the door keeping out the riffraff. All you riffraff are welcome <laughs> in this hall. So that's this beautiful openness. When people feel welcome, and they feel respected. That's where all this lack of self-esteem vanish. Isn't that really what people want in this world? To be respected, to be understood. Yes, I'm not the best. Yeah, I'm a monk who keeps telling the same jokes and stories every week. But that's who I am. So you're at peace with yourself. There's one story I haven't told for a long time, which I remember today, and that was the story of the two carrots. <laughs> you remember this? This is a golden oldie. So once there were these two carrots, and they were walking down the road in St George's Terrace, which is one of the main streets here in Perth. And as they were walking down, talking to each other, minding their own business, one of these drunk drivers lost control of the car, the car went up on the pavement and hit one of the carrots. And the carrot was badly injured. The other carrot rang zero, zero, zero. The ambulance came straight in the back with his friend, the other unheard carrot, with him. Straight to Royal Perth Hospital, straight into the emergency room, straight to triage. They realised this carrot was badly injured, so they took him into the surgery. And his friend, if ever you've been waiting in the emergency rooms, you know, in the waiting rooms rather, in hospitals, it's so tense, you don't know what's going to happen. After three hours, the doctor came out, the surgeon, and said, your friend, Mr. Carrot, I've got some good news and bad news for you. The good news is your, your friend, the carrot who was injured, he's going to live, he's going to survive. But the bad news, he's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. <laughs> I just can't say that with a straight face. <laughs> One of my favourite jokes. He's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. The man. <laughs> so I can't even tell a joke properly, but I'm not going to lose my self-esteem for that. <laughs> so you can see that when you're at ease with yourself, it means that you know you have your self-esteem, but then you take that a little bit further and make it more full, going in the same direction, by having this wonderful no self-esteem. I had to pause there. It's not no self-esteem, it's no self-esteem. Valuing that you don't own these things. I don't own my mistakes. If I own my mistakes, I keep on remembering them, and I remember all the terrible things which I did, and all the hopeless things I did. And the idea of no self, instead of using it as a, a philosophy, is used as a practical means of saying, what, what do you really own? What do you possess? And this is a terrible thing about when people make mistakes or they're successful in life, they tend to own those attainments and they own those, those failures. And that is where the Buddhist idea of no self, you don't own anything. Was that really you who did that mistake many, many years ago? Was that really you who did that amazing, wonderful thing? which you're so proud of and you're honoured by. And a lot of times you look back and if you own it, that is where the trouble comes. That is where people, they lose this 
this um, lack of self-esteem, and they get self-esteem, and that goes this terrible thing as pride and arrogance. That's where you get monks like me, coming up here and saying, I am so humble. On my humility, there's no monk in the whole world as humble as I am. In fact, I have applied to the Guinness Book of Records to be entered as the most humble monk in the world. <laughs> I say, if you're humble, you should flaunt it. <laughs> now you can see some people actually do get arrogance. And that arrogance there, you know, if you think I'm an arrogant guy, you know, just in the latest edition of the Enlightened Times, there's a picture of me working on the roof of you know, the Jhana Grove. I actually get down there and dirty. I was mixing concrete the other day, you know, two or three days ago. I was a bit upset because it almost happened again. That story, which I love telling, of when I was mixing concrete some years ago, and this Sri Lankan lady came, and you know, a very high-class Sri Lankan lady, Unfortunately, we don't get any of that um, level here in, <laughs> in the centre, apparently, because dressed in a really, really nice sari, very expensive, lots of makeup, and when you have a high-class Sri Lankan girl, they wear all these bangles. And there were so many bangles, clink, clank, clonk, it sounded like what I call an ice cream truck coming to the monastery. <laughs> and you Sri Lankans, you know what I mean. And when she saw me, you know, I'd just come from the building site. So I had cement all over me, splattered on my face, all over my robes. I looked real mess, like, you know, labourers on building sites. You know, you can't, you know, be smart when you've just been building. And she came up to me and said, I'm looking for Ajahn Brahm. And I'm very smart. I said straight away, oh, Madam, if you go to the hall there, he'll probably be down there again in about five or ten minutes. So she went to the hall, I had a quick shower, you know, changed my robes to clean ones, went down there and talked to her. You know, she didn't know I was the same one. <laughs> because afterwards, and this is a true story, afterwards she told me, she said, that was a wonderful talk, you've got a beautiful monastery here, but if you don't mind me criticising one thing, on the way here I saw one of your monks, he was very badly dressed, it's inappropriate for a monk to be badly dressed like that. And I said, oh, I will talk to that monk later. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't know it was the same one. <clears throat> so, you know, sometimes you're up there in front of thousands of people, and sometimes you're getting, you know, dirty, you know, down there in the, in the mud and the grime of a building site. And I really love doing that, because otherwise... But sometimes I ask myself, who is the real Ajahn Brahm? Neither is, because you don't own any of those. If you own the famous person, you get proud. If you own the person who's always down there in the dirt you know, building, then you get low self-esteem. That's when you don't own any of these things. That's when you have no self-esteem. None of these things are you. And when you don't define yourself as anything, you have no more limitations. The sky or the trenches, they're the limit. You can do anything when you don't have a sense of self and ego and who you are supposed to be. It's a great thing of being a monk. You are totally free of all of this status. You see the robe which I wear and the robe which the next monk wears. They look the same. We don't have little stripes on our side to say how senior we are. We don't have little pips you know, on our side and on the shoulders to say who's the most senior monk and who's the most junior. This is why we don't have that status, because we don't want to own anything. When you don't own your attainments or your failures, when you don't own the crime you committed many years ago, this is for the prisoners, that's not you, don't own it. Because if you own it, you become it. When you become it, you repeat it. Even, I, I do repeat myself very often, but these stories, they just come in. And that was that, uh, story of going to the Singapore Institute of Mental Health 
just giving a presentation, being praised by one of the heads of department of the schizophrenia unit, and just inviting me back to his unit in this big sort of complex, and asking him on the way, how do you treat schizophrenia? And he says, I don't treat schizophrenia. And this is the head of the unit which deals with all cases in that island and many from overseas. So I don't treat schizophrenia. He said, well, what, what do you do? He said, I treat the other part of the patient. Brilliant. Otherwise, you're telling that person, that patient, they're going to own their schizophrenia. They are a schizophrenic. That is not going to solve the problem. Actually, the, I know this is not really what schizophrenics are, but there was a good Buddhist joke. What does a Buddhist schizophrenic aim for in life? He wants to be two with the universe. <laughs> now that's not absolutely true. Schizophrenics are not like that, but it's a very good joke. <laughs> it's a Buddhist joke. You know, most people want to be one with the universe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I apologise to all people uh, who sometimes suffer schizophrenic episodes, but <laughs> it's a good joke, though. <laughs> But when you own that problem, that's when it really is a problem. So the idea of no self-esteem is, this isn't me. I don't own this. This is an episode which happens from time to time. But it's not me. I don't own it. The crime, the mistake which I did, I don't own that. Which means it's more easy to let it go. Why is it that these things which happened to you, or which you did yourself in the past, why is it so hard to move away from it? Why is it that they tend to these bad experiences keep almost pursuing you? You know, just like uh, you know, one of these. Um, uh, what is it? The person who keeps following. Uh, no, this is the sexual predators. Stalkers, like a stalker. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you. You see, even I sort of forget sometimes. So, but I'm very happy that I forget at my age. It's doing pretty good. So these stalkers, it's like the past is a stalker which keeps on coming up. Why is it we can't let it go? And a lot of time, it's not the stalker's problem. It's not the, the past acts. It's because we think we own that. And the idea of no self-esteem it's esteeming the fact that you don't own these things. The only thing you really own is your present. That's the only thing you possess and have in this life. If you think you own the past, you can't let it go. If you think you own the future, you'll always be worried and anxious about it. When you realise the only thing you ever have is what's right in front of you right now, this present moment. That's what we call no self Esteem. Esteemy. Yes, I agree with you. <laughs> so this is working, you know, from, no, uh, from low self-esteem to high self-esteem and then to no self-esteem. So you kids, if you fail the exam, don't worry about it. That wasn't really you, was it? How many times have you said to yourself, when you make a mistake, oh, I wasn't feeling myself today? Excellent. Carry on. Every time, every time you make a mistake, oh, that wasn't the real me. There's an old Sufi, there's an old Sufi story of actually how to have high self-esteem. And that was this... You know, sometimes people think there's no wisdom in Islam, but in the Sufi tradition of Islam, it's brilliant. It's really close to Buddhism. And in that tradition, there was this guy, Nasruddin. He got some great stories of this guy, Nasruddin. He was this mullah in you know, Persia, you know, before it became Iran. And one day, he had his students, and he took them to a fair 
just as a reward for all their hard studies. And at these old fairs, like the Royal Show here in Perth, they had all these stalls and competitions. And being a long time ago, they had an archery competition, just like you maybe have like shooting competition. This was archery. And you could, you know, for a couple of dollars, you can get three arrows. And if you hit the ball, you get a little teddy bear or something. And so this master, this religious leader, gave a couple of dollars in front of all his students and said, OK, I'll have a go. It's only shooting arrows. Anybody can do that. And even though his students advised, you don't know what you're doing. You make a fool of yourself. Nevertheless, he had a go. He put the arrow in the bow and shot it. It only made half the distance. He never shot a bow and arrow before. And because this was a very important figure in the community, people started giggling. This leader was making an idiot of himself. And so he took his next arrow and his students said, quick, get out of here, you're embarrassing us. He said, no, no, no. He said, that was a shot of a hasty man. So this time he took more time. He put the, the arrow in the bow, he pulled it much further back and this time it made the distance but about a hundred foot to the left, almost killed bystanders. <laughs> And he turned around and said, that was a shot of an arrogant man. And he put the bow in the third time when people were giggling and laughing at this idiot trying to shoot an arrow. And this time he pulled the arrow back and he shot the arrow and it went right in the middle of the target. And as he claimed his prize, a teddy bear, they said, well, if the first shot was a shot of a, 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 a hasty man and the second shot was a shot of an arrogant man, who was the third shot? He said, oh, that was me. <laughs> now you understand no self-esteem so if you have no self you don't own anything you can actually choose which one of those you want to be when you have a self you are locked in to this idea of who you think you are I can't do maths at school I am ugly. I am schizophrenic. If you lock yourself into that, then there's no freedom. If you let go of all of those judgments, then you are free. You can be whoever you want to be. That is my trick as a monk. I can be the laborer. I can be the comedian. I can be the person who does... Um, uh, funeral services where I have to stop telling jokes. You can do whatever you are and then you are free. Free to enjoy whatever life brings you in this moment. So that is actually how we make the movement from low self-esteem to self-esteem eventually to no self-esteem. You can be whoever, make mistakes, do successful things, it's all the same. Thank you for listening. <laughs> and sorry for the carrot joke. <laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> and also, please, we have three questions at the end of every talk, but a couple of weeks ago, during the meditation on a Saturday afternoon, there was one guy sitting in here, and he rooted his question you know, via Indonesia. So it came on the thing here of John from Indonesia, when he was actually sitting right in front. <laughs> <laughs> so please be honest. Ajahn, <laughs> this is Chami from Melbourne in Australia. Ajahn, when bad things keep on happening one after the other, how can anyone feel strong under such circumstances and not feel helpless? They don't keep happening bad one after another. You have just asked a nice question and you're listening to your answer. A good thing has happened. You get your question answered. We've broken the spell. <coughs> so the thing is, our perception is that bad things happen one after the other, but the truth of the matter is, is many good things happen as well. Why is it we only pay attention to the bad things which happen? So a lot of times we teach to change your perceptions and you'll find, yes, some bad things happen to you today, but also many good things happen as well. But we only remember the bad things. 
It's the old story, Chammy, of the two chicken farmers. Again, golden oldie, but this is the answer to your question, Chammy. Two chicken farmers, first chicken farmer goes into the shed early in the morning with a basket to collect the produce of the night before. They go into the shed and they fill their basket full of chicken shit and they leave the eggs in the shed to rot. They bring the shit back into the house and makes the smell the family very upset at them. The second chicken farmer takes a basket into the shed and fills it full of eggs. They leave the shit in the shed to rot to become fertilizer later on. They take the eggs back into the house where they make an omelette for their family, sell the rest of the eggs in the market for cash. That's a smart chicken farmer. The meaning of that story is, Chami, when you remember your past, what do you put in the basket and take home with you? If we keep remembering the bad things which happen to us in life, we are shit collectors. <laughs> Leave the bad things in the past to rot. Collect the eggs. There's many wonderful things which happen to you, Chammy. Beautiful things. You put those in your basket and bring them home with you. Bring them into the present moment with you. And leave the shit in the past to rot. And then you find that actually many wonderful things do happen to you. But you're leaving them in the past. You're forgetting about them. And that's why we come under the impression that only bad things keep happening. They don't. Wonderful things happen as well. Remember those. And then we get a balanced view in life. We keep the beautiful eggs. Because you can't make an omelette out of chicken shit. <laughs> the next is Us <laughs> Usita from Sri Lanka. De Ajahn Brahm. How can karma exist if self does not exist? If you understand there's no self left, then you're beyond the karma. You are enlightened and the karma will not send you to another rebirth. But as long as you understand that there is a self, if that's your perception, if that's your idea that you are, then you'll make karma and suffer as a result. So it's not if a self exists or not, if you think and act and perceive a self exists. That is a problem. So don't be philosophical. Usita, in Sri Lanka, if you have any perception of a self, if you're not fully enlightened, you have that perception, therefore you're subject to karma. If you're totally enlightened, you've realized that, not just through a thought, but really realized it, there's nobody in here, you have no doubt about that, it's an experience, not a, just a philosophy, then you're beyond karma. Question three, Sadi from New Zealand. Dear Ajahn Brahm, as an artist, I've lost confidence in my work and I'm not sure how to revive it. Please help me. Thank you. <coughs> you know that most people, especially Sadi, they become famous after they die. <laughs> <laughs> that may be you. <laughs> so please, if it, that is you, please bequeath all of your artwork to the nuns monastery. <laughs> we need the cash. Now it's interesting, why is it sometimes we lose confidence? And a lot of times, you know, this may be you, I haven't seen your work, Sadi, but a lot of the times, you know, we look at the work, we see all the faults in it. Again, because we are the owner. Just like I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I go to Bodhinyana Monastery, if I'm the abbot there, I see all the things which are wrong with the place. Just like your home, you go back to this evening, you see all the things which need to be fixed up, all the things which are wrong, a visitor never sees that. They say, what a beautiful place this is. Poor old Phil, where's he gone? He's the president of this place, and so he sees all the things which need to be fixed up. He's got this whole list of things we're going to do to this place, especially the community hall during the retreat period. Paint it, you know, change the roof here, put a new garden over there. Can you see anything wrong with the place? Because you're visitors, that's why. You know, the owners, we see all the things which are wrong. So if you're an owner of your artwork, it will never be good enough. You'll only see the mistakes in it, the faults. But if you're a visitor, if somebody comes to see your artwork and they say, that's beautiful, that's wonderful, that's really impressive, believe them. Don't believe yourself. So when people see your artwork, put it on show. And when people say, wow, that's really interesting, 
They're the people to believe, not you, because you're too close to it. You own it. You can't see its beauty. Say where I could not see the beauty of Bodhinyana Monastery until I stopped owning it and looked at it as a visitor. You can't see the beauty in yourself until you look at yourself like other people look at you. And then, wow, I'm actually okay. You know that many monks, I got over this, when they first come and give talks, they can't believe, like the nuns, they can't believe that so many people come and listen to them. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. You think, hey, I'm actually wise. People want to listen to me. Just like the artist, after a while you think, wow, I can actually paint, I can create, I can do something which people want to buy. Then you get your confidence, not from what you think about your artwork, but seeing your artwork through the eyes of a visitor. Then you get confidence in it. Look, it's amazing, this is absolutely true, that each one of you, when you come in here, I can only see the beauty and good in you. When people come and they still tell me all their faults and they can't find a partner in life and their career is really bad and they've invested and lost all their money and blah, 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 and they feel so bad and down about themselves. I say, you're a really nice guy, you're a great girl, what are you worried about? I could see that. And if only they could see what I could see in themselves, then they would have their confidence. And if only the artist, Sadi from New Zealand, could see what other people see in your artwork. You would have confidence and realize it's beautiful work. Carry on. So it's actually seeing through the eyes of another rather than your own eyes. The no self esteem. Many people like you. You have many friends. You have great times together. So why can't you accept that? rather than thinking, oh, I'm hopeless, oh, I'm terrible, oh, I can't do anything right. Oh, no. You can do many things right. So anyway, those are the answers for one, two, and three. I hope they're okay. I don't care if they're not, because <laughs> <laughs> I've got no self-esteem. <laughs> so any questions from here? Any questions from the audience here? Give you guys a chance as well, so you don't have to reroute your your um, questions through Saudi Arabia or somewhere. <laughs> okay, so thank you all for listening to the talk about uh, no self-esteem. And there is a pseudo class on Sunday, but I'm afraid. Uh, it will not be for me, but we, Ajahn Appy is doing a pseudo class on Sunday and a meditation tomorrow because, oh, it's really hard work. I've got to fly all the way to Frankfurt to teach a retreat. It's very tough life being a monk. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, Frankfurt on the weekend because there's lots of people in Germany who also want to have some meditation. So I'm going to teach a retreat over there. Uh, I don't carry any bags. So I've got 30 kilos of free luggage. If anyone is under 30 kilos of weight, <laughs> I could get you in my suitcase and you can go to Europe for free. <laughs> Unfortunately, you're too heavy. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, just pay respects to Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then we can go and do whatever we want to do. Arahang Sama Sambodo Bagawa Buddhang Bagawandang Abiwa Demi Soakato Bagawata Damo Dhamanamasami so pati pano bhagavato sawaka sango sangang namami <laughs> I'm still laughing at that carrot joke. <laughs> <laughs>